Hi everyone and welcome to the Science of Sports latest video post series. I'm Russ Tucker and what I'm going to be doing over the next seven or eight episodes is taking you through the latest science on pacing strategies and the regulation of exercise by the brain. Now this is something of a controversial topic. It's fairly new in exercise science but it's controversial because it creates a dispute between how exercise performance is either limited on the one hand or regulated by the brain on the other hand. And it also introduces us to the concept of a central governor. Now that's a term that was coined by Professor Tim Noakes, who was really one of the first people to propose how the brain regulates exercise. And I think that unfortunately that term has been something of a stumbling block for many people because they interpret it to mean that there's a very specific location in the brain, almost like a black box that is responsible for controlling exercise. And and we know based on the evidence and the complexity of physiology during exercise that it's highly unlikely that you'll find one region. But I think that's one of the things that most people attack. And, and when I was in Denver recently, a scientist came up to me and said that we must all look for a little man in your head who controls you. And I think that's it's, it's pretty nonsensical and the science suggests otherwise. And what I'm going to do is take you systematically through what the science does say, the evidence for pacing and how it's achieved, so that we can all understand exactly what that concept uh, is meant to portray and what it means. Now we know that pacing is obvious. Uh, anyone who's ever done a 5k race compared to a marathon implicitly knows that you have to pace them differently. But what we don't know is how that pacing is achieved. And the purpose of this series, which will probably, as I said, be 7 or 8 short 5 minute clips, is to introduce the science to you, take you through how we believe it's achieved and then propose a model. So we'll have some good discussion hopefully along the way and as we learn a little bit about pacing strategy. So this is that presentation as I said given in Denver earlier this year and it was part of a symposium on pacing strategy where a number of experts presented their views and my talk consisted of three parts. First was the pattern of pacing, second was the purpose which is where you look at the physiological variables and why you need to pace and then third is the perception, specifically the perception of fatigue or exertion that we proposed is the key variable that regulates pacing. Now this is going to be a fairly quick overview of the uh, whole concept. For those who are hungry for a little bit more, these two papers are recommended reading. There's a paper that I wrote with Professor Tim Noakes and the second one, this paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, explains the perception-based model for exercise performance. So anyone wanting to read more detail, that's where to look for after you've seen this series. Now in order to understand the significance of pacing, and where exercise science was coming from, I'm going to use an analogy from a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon just to illustrate this point. So he's driving along in the car with his parents and he sees a sign saying that the limit for the bridge they're about to cross is 10 tons. And of course he asks, how do they know that number? And so the answer is fairly obvious. They drive bigger and bigger trucks over it until it breaks. And then they weigh the last truck and rebuild the bridge. And of course, that's a ridiculous answer. Uh, not to perhaps a, a young child, but anyone who knows better knows that that's not the case. But the interesting thing is that in exercise science, this has very much been the approach to fatigue over the years. Because for us, fatigue is pretty much the same thing as the load limit of a bridge. Because we're interested in knowing how fast can humans go, how far can they cycle. So that's our performance limit. And the way that that performance limit has yet, had traditionally been understood is by having athletes cycle at higher and higher workloads until they have to stop. In other words, until they break or fail. And then what the physiologists tend to do is measure what's different at the point of fatigue and then they infer that that was the cause of fatigue in the first place. And that's why we've got concepts like limiting VO2 max or limiting lactate levels, limiting cardiac outputs because we've made athletes exercise to the point of failure and then we've measured why they failed and that's then been the physiology of understanding fatigue. Now it's important to understand that if we want to understand limits to human performance then there are two ways to do it and the one which I've just explained is that you can design failure into your experiment and that's exercise to fatigue and then you infer the variables. But the other way to do it which I believe to be more realistic is to exercise for performance because then by definition you have to avoid failure. It makes no sense to do a 10 kilometer trial and fail after 8 kilometers. So you have to avoid failure and that's where you measure pacing strategy and if you do this then you can model the homeostats. And so what we're looking at then is the performance limit and the physiological basis for pacing 
and Carl Foster proposed that pacing strategy is the process by which you regulate performance so that your energy stores are used before you finish but not so far from the end that a meaningful slowdown can occur. Now that's an obvious statement but it shows you that there is a factor for performance then there's homeostasis and fatigue and those three things all have to be regulated at the same time and you can't achieve one without the other. You can't regulate performance without avoiding fatigue and you can't regulate homeostasis without achieving a maximal or optimal performance at the same time. So we know Ben Kaiser wrote in 2003 that exercise starts and ends in the brain and that's really the crux of this issue and that's where we're going to take the series moving forward. And in order to do that, I'm going to propose this concept where the rating of perceived exertion mediates an anticipatory forecasting as well as interpreting the feedback information from various systems in order to regulate exercise performance. And that's where we're headed to over the course of the next few posts and video series. So that's part one done. What I'm going to do in part two is introduce the pattern of pacing and specifically look at long duration exercise lasting many minutes or hours and short duration exercise lasting a few seconds and show you how the pacing strategy is quite different and that has some quite important physiological implications for why the pacing is achieved and how it is regulated. So if you'll join me for part two we'll tackle that. If there are any questions or comments on this introductory piece feel free to make them in the discussion below. We'll chat soon.